In this video, I'm going to show you another form of electron configuration uh, using Bohr diagrams and then eventually electron dot diagrams. So Bohr diagrams, we pretty much already know because we saw the Bohr model of the atom. We know that this is not the correct model of the atom, but the Bohr model is actually very helpful in helping us see uh, where things are at in the atom and where the electrons are located. So a Bohr diagram is just this visual picture here showing us the subatomic particles and how the electrons are arranged in the energy levels. So we already know the protons and neutrons are in the center of the atom in the nucleus. So we'll show them there. And the electrons are going to be around the nucleus in the different energy levels or in the different orbitals. Again, this is not you know, technically the most accurate model of the atom. But in terms of seeing where things are located, it's actually very helpful. First, I'm going to go through the steps for how to do these Bohr diagrams, and then we'll do a few examples. So the first thing you got to do for one of these Bohr diagrams, you find the element uh, that you're doing it for on the periodic table, figure out the number of electrons, protons, and neutrons. So we should be good with that. We've already went over how to do uh, this, how to find the number of subatomic particles for any element. All right. The row will determine how many energy levels or how many rings you are drawing for your example. So it's literally whatever row that element is in, that's how many rings you draw. So be careful. It's not saying, well, what if it's in the 3D? No, it says what row, whatever row the element is in on the table, that's how many rings you draw. So if the element was in, say, row number two, you would draw two rings. Then you're going to label the number of protons and neutrons in the center of the atom. We know the protons and neutrons go in the center. You don't have to draw out all the protons and the neutrons. Just labeling how many there are of each is good enough for this. And we'll put the correct number of energy levels, uh, the correct number of rings. And then what we'll do is we need to show the electrons as dots in the energy levels. So we have to be careful here because the uh, energy levels can only hold a specific number of electrons in each. The first energy level can only hold two, the second can only hold eight, the third can only hold 18, and so on. Uh, remember here, there's a little uh, formula to help you remember this. You can use uh, 2n squared to figure out the maximum number of electrons for any energy level. n would be the energy level you're in. So if you're in the second row or the second energy level, you know, uh, you do 2 squared, which is 4 times 2, you can have all right, so these are the steps for the Bohr diagrams, but you need to actually follow them uh, and you know practice some examples here. We're going to do one of these Bohr diagrams for carbon. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is figure out the number of uh, each subatomic particle here for carbon. So if you look up carbon on your table, uh, it's going to be uh, element number six. So it has an atomic number of six, so it has six protons. There's no charge, so therefore it has six electrons. When you go to the periodic table and round the atomic mass, 12.01 rounds to 12. That's the most common mass number. So if you take 12 minus the number of protons, you get the number of neutrons, which is also 6 here. I know this one's 666. Uh, you know, organic chemistry is the study of carbon. Uh, I think that's why it's so difficult for many people. It really is uh, a crazy element here in terms of its subatomic particle numbers. So... Uh, now what we're going to do is figure out how many rings we need to draw. So you look at the row that carbon's in. Carbon is in the second row on your periodic table. So that means we need to draw two rings here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to uh, label the number of protons and neutrons in our nucleus. Remember, protons and neutrons go in the nucleus. So we'll just label 6P, 6N to represent our nucleus. And now we need to show the electrons here as dots uh, on our diagram. So you have to be careful. If you're in this first ring, the first ring closest to the nucleus, that's your first energy level. The first energy level can only hold at most two electrons. So we're going to draw our two dots here. Uh, you could split them up. It's not that big a deal to me if you draw them close together like that, if it makes your counting easier. Uh, and then we have our second energy level here. Uh, we only have four electrons left. So that means we're going to have 
four in the second. Again, you could split them up. I like to draw them together just because it makes counting easier. Uh, so this would be the Bohr diagram for carbon. What I recommend you do so that you don't lose points here, for all these Bohr diagrams nearby, I like to write how many uh, electrons I'm drawing in each of the rings. So for example, I would do something like this. In the first, I have two electrons. In the second, I have four. So that there's no confusion. If I'm grading your paper and trying to say, well, is that a stray dot or is that uh, meant to be there? Uh, this is quickly, I can check this and I can see here just from your labels that, oh, you only meant to draw two dots in the first or four in the second, so on. So this would be a good example here of a Bohr diagram. If we want to try another one here, we can do this for aluminum. So if you look up aluminum on the periodic table, it's element number 13. So we have 13 protons, uh, no charge, though the same number of electrons here. And when you take your uh, most common mass number for aluminum, which is 27, minus the number of protons, uh, you get 14 neutrons. So which row on the periodic table is aluminum in? Which row number? He's in the uh, third row. So you have to draw three rings for aluminum. So one, two, three. We're going to label our protons and neutrons in the center to represent our nucleus. So we got 13 protons, 14 neutrons, and now we need to show our electrons as dots. So this time we got to show 13 dots, no more, no less. The first energy level can only hold two. Again, I like to label this nearby so I know there's two electrons in the first. The second can hold at most eight. So by putting eight, we're not going to be at 13 or over. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Again, label nearby. I'm putting eight in the second. That puts us at 10. So there's only three remaining. So one, two, three in the third ring here. All right, so that gives us our total of 13 electrons. So this would be the Bohr diagram here for aluminum. So now we're going to try this for manganese. So uh, you're more than welcome to pause this, try it on your own, and then come back and see how you did, or just follow along with me. So for this one, uh, manganese is element number 25. So we got 25 protons, therefore 25 electrons. And when you do your subtracting to get your neutrons, it should be 30, all right? So which row on the periodic table is manganese in? So manganese is in the fourth row. Yeah, I understand that manganese is in the 3D, but that's not what we're asking here. What row on the periodic table is manganese in? The fourth. So you have to have four rings. So we have one, two, three, and four. So when we label our protons and neutrons in the center, we got 25P and 30N. Now when we do our electrons, the first energy level, the first ring can only hold two. So we'll label this nearby. The first has two. The second can only have eight. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And this is where it gets interesting, and you got to be careful. The third can hold at most 18. So you got to be careful here. The uh, third ring for manganese is not going to be filled. You would not see the third ring filling until you reached element number 30, or zinc. And manganese is not there yet. So the third ring here would only have 13. So four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, and I'll, I'll show you why in a second. And then the fourth is going to have just two. All right. So if you total this up here, you have ten plus fifteen. That gives you your twenty-five. All right. People always mix this up because they say, "Well, the third ring can hold uh, 18. I'm going to put them all in. No. So you don't have 15 in the third ring for manganese, even though it can hold 18. Uh, an easy way to confirm this, if you're confused, like where do the electrons go? 
use your electron configuration. If you wrote out the electron configuration here for manganese, it'd be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d5. All right. So if you use this, it'll actually help you here figure out where things go. So remember, the big number in front is your energy level. Essentially, it's your ring. So in the first energy level or the first ring, that's right here. Just these electrons. The only electrons that have a one here in this electron configuration are these two. So we drew them in the first ring. Well, then notice the second would be these electrons and these electrons. So the two and the six or eight. So now when we were doing our third ring here, the ones that had the three in front would be the 3s2, the 3p6, and the 3d5. So if you total up all the superscripts here, you have two plus six is eight plus five is 13. And then the fourth ring, the only one here that has a four as the energy level are those two electrons in the 4s. So if you're confused about where these electrons go exactly, write out the electron configuration. And literally, it will tell you which energy level to put the electrons in. The big number in front is the energy level, so it tells you which ring to put the electrons in. So that would be the Bohr diagram for manganese. Another idea that we need to talk about here are valence electrons. Valence electrons are the electrons in the outermost energy level. So they're the furthest from the nucleus. They're the most important, uh, and they're the ones we're going to talk about the most because they're the ones that are involved in the chemical reactions. If they're the outer electrons, the furthest from the nucleus, those are the ones that are going to be involved in the chemical reactions here. So they're very important. Typically, the valence electrons are going to be the highest S and P electrons added together. So the highest energy level S and P electrons total up would give you your valence electrons. So for example, if we were doing this for arsenic, Arsenic is number 33 on the periodic table. If we just did the kernel notation here for arsenic, it'd be argon and then 4s2, 3d10, 4p3. So according to uh, the rules here, valence electrons are the outermost electrons or the electrons in the highest energy level S and P. Well, if you notice here, the highest energy level for arsenic would be four. All right, and notice, there's two in the 4s, three in the 4p, so three plus two gives arsenic five valence electrons. Uh, so it's literally that simple. Just find the highest s and p electrons for an element, add them together, and you know the total number of valence electrons for an element. There's a very uh, simple trick for this as well. You can kind of use your periodic table for this. It's important to understand what valence electrons mean, but you can find this quickly on your table as well. If you find arsenic on your periodic table, go to the top here of the column where arsenic is. Okay, so find arsenic is number 33. Go to the top of the column. Do you see the number with the A? If you see it, it says 5A for that entire column with arsenic in it. That entire column has five valence electrons. So the number with the A on the periodic table tells you the number of valence electrons here. Um, for any element in that particular column. So if you notice, your periodic table only goes up to uh, 8a. You can only have at most eight valence electrons. And if you uh, take closer notice, there's no a's in the d block in the transition metals. That's because, remember, the d block is always one row behind. So you will never have your highest electrons being in the d block. So you would always have your highest electrons for any d being in the s. For example, if you were in the 3D, uh, you already passed through the 4S. 4 would be higher than 3. So you would only ever have two valence electrons for any of those D block elements, unless it's one of those exceptions like copper and chromium. They would just have one valence electron. Um, so it's pretty easy here. You can just use your periodic table, go to the top of the column, find the number with the A, and you know the number of valence electrons. So I would say uh, you can try these examples here at the bottom. Uh, neon magnesium, carbon, and chlorine. So I would pause the video, see if you can quickly look up the number of valence electrons for each of those, and then come back and see how you did. So hopefully these are the answers you got. Um, being able to look up the number of valence electrons for any element 
uh, is very important. You need to be able to do this. So again, all you have to do is find the element on the table, go to the top of the column, find the number uh, with the A, and that will tell you the number of valence electrons for any element in that column. So our last form of electron configuration here is a pretty simple one. They're called electron dot structures. These are just diagrams that show the number of valence electrons for an element around the symbol. So they're also known as Lewis structures or Lewis dot structures. Uh, they're pretty simple here. You just have to be able to look up the element, find the number of valence electrons, and show the number of valence electrons around the symbol. So here's uh, the steps. The first thing you do is determine the number of valence electrons like we just did. Find the element, go to the top of the column, find the number with the A. That'll tell you the number of valence electrons. You write the element symbol, uh, so that should be pretty simple. And then you add the electrons one at a time as dots to each side of the symbol. All right, we kind of think of the symbol as having four sides, a left, a right, a top, and a bottom. So you would add electrons as dots one side at a time until you're forced to pair up. So the most you could ever have is two on each side, but you would never have two on a side until you had uh, at least one on each side first. So I think we should do uh, an example here. We can do this for uh, nitrogen. So uh, the first thing we need to do is figure out the number of valence electrons. If you find nitrogen on your table, it's element number seven, go to the top. He's in the 5A. So nitrogen has five valence electrons or five outer electrons here. So we'll write this symbol. Nitrogen is going to be N. All right. And then what we have to do is we have to show the number of valence electrons as dots around the symbol. So we have to have five dots here. So according to the rules, it doesn't matter where you start, which side, but the key is you have to have one electron on each side before you're forced to pair. So I have one electron on each side now. I have one more electron left in order to get uh, the fifth. It doesn't matter which side you draw it on. You can put it anywhere, really. So I'm going to put it on the top. So that would be the electron dot structure for nitrogen. I can see the five valence electrons and I have one on each side before I pair it up. It's that simple. I want you to try the electron dot structures here for these four elements, look them up, find the valence electrons, and then quickly do uh, the dot structures. And then when you rejoin the video, uh, the answers will be here and you can see how you did. So pause the video right now. So here are the electron dot structures for these four elements. Remember, it doesn't necessarily matter which side you have these on. So for example, if you were doing the boron, maybe you had an electron over here, but not up top. That's fine. As long as you have one on each side and one side just has none. All right. Remember the maximum number of valence electrons you can have is eight. So when you're doing one of these, if you're drawing more than eight dots, you know, you're doing it wrong. So just be careful with that. So electron dot structure is pretty easy, but you have to be able to determine the number of valence electrons.